Okay, so the Ford Folkson algorithm is an iterative, you know, approach. And the idea is you start off with your network graph. So you have a network graph and it has your capacities on it. Then you, what you're going to do is you're going to find an ST path where you can push the flow through. Okay? It says once you've found the ST path to push the flow through, you're going to utilize this flow and capacity because now your graph will have flows and capacities on them. So you have the, you know, a flow capacity graph. And you find the residual graph of this. And then it says, okay, now from this residual graph, find a path, an ST path, to push the flow through. And then once again, once you've found this path and you have a flow pushing through this path, you find the flow, or you have this at that point, you find the residual graph of this new one, and you keep on going. And you're going to keep on going until you can no longer find an ST path. Okay, and at that point, you have determined the max flow. Now, one of the things that this algorithm doesn't tell you, which is a pretty vital part of this algorithm, is how to find this ST path. It says just find it, and then you work through it. And if you work through it such that you find the residual graph of it, and then you utilize the residual graph to find the new path, and you keep on doing that, so you keep on updating and going through the process, you will get the max flow out. But it doesn't tell you how to find this path. So basically it says you can use any technique that you want to find that path. Okay, so for this first example, we're not going to go in detail on how to find the path. That's going to just be a separate section, mainly because I just want to show you the process of you have a path, you then update your residual, and then you have your residual graph, and you find a path in the residual, and you update that one, until you reach a point where you don't actually have any more paths left to find, and then how to actually show your max flows and everything. So there'll be a separate section on how actually the paths were found. So in this example, there's our original graph. It's the same one that's in your notes, and we are going to choose the same path kind of situation. So we're going to have a path from S to B to C to T, and if we actually just show that, and I just want to show you how you actually work out how much flow to push through your path. So now we have a path. We know this is a path from S to T. You can see that. You know, it's, it's not exactly very hard or difficult to notice because we do have an arc going from S to B. We do have an arc going from B to C. We do have an arc going from C to T. We can just randomly actually create that path, you know, by just looking at it, by virtue of looking at it. You can use algorithms to find the path, but right now we're just selecting a random path. And all of these have flows of two. Now, sometimes you'll have a situation where you'll have a bottleneck occurring. By a bottleneck occurring, let's say we had a path and we had a path like this kind of situation. It had a flow of three here, and it, this has a flow of five, and this has a flow of two. If you have a path, and let's just call this, you know, U1, U2, U3, and U4, if you had this path occurring, you could only push through a maximum flow of this two. So the minimum capacity on your um, graph will be your flow that you push through your entire path. Now, in this situation, they're all two. So we're going to push through two everywhere. So when we update this and we write this, you know, with the actual flow involved in it, this will be two out of two, this will be two out of two, this will be two out of two, and all the rest of the areas will be your zero. Okay, so you have... That will be your like your first case. So you find any path, because the fork Folkson doesn't specify how you must find the path, so it can be any path. You find any path, and then you perform the residual once you've found this path with your pushing of your flows. So you update it so it looks like this. So you have your flows and capacities running on it, and now you look at your residual for this graph. So let's go ahead and work out the residual for this graph. You'll notice that this has been done in the lecture notes or the videos of how to work out your residual capacities, which is separate to this section. So you may want to just skip ahead because you've already actually worked out the residual graph for this. If not, it's literally the exact same explanation is going to come up to work out the residual for this graph. 
Okay, so let's level up our skills and actually work out a full residual graph of this system. So this system actually says there's a path here where you're pushing through a flow of two from here to here to here to here. So that's like, it says, okay, we have a path. The path is pushing through a flow of two. And that's where all these twos are coming from. And everywhere else, you know, you, you're having your zeros. So now we say, okay, let's actually work out the residual graph after we have this, you know, path where we're pushing through the flow. So what is the residual graph after this flow system? So I'm just going to rub this out so we have, you know, some clear, clear images to work with. So what we're going to have to do, and this is the part that kind of sucks, is we have to work out the residual capacity in both directions of every single edge on our graph. So when we're doing this, we're going to have to work out CF of S to A, and we're going to have to work out CF of A to S. Okay, so let's go ahead and start that pretty long process. So we're going to say, okay, CF of S to A is equal to, so remember that's the residual capacity after the flow of edge SA is equal to the capacity of SA, edge SA, minus the flow from S to A, plus the flow from A to S. So remember, we use using the skew symmetry there in our, you know, working out our residual capacity. And the idea of the skew symmetry there is it's actually working out the total flow. So it's combining, you know, your back and forth situation. Okay, so let's go ahead and put in the answers. Well, not the answers. Let's go ahead and work it out. So we have the capacity of SA is 4. The flow is 0. And the flow backwards is also 0. So we have a capacity of 4. So what we currently have on our new graph, so we're going to have a new residual graph. And we're just going to draw it here in the corner. So I'm just going to put in the vertices along. So we have B, we have D, we have C, and we have T. We now know we have from S to A, an edge which clearly doesn't look very neat right now. You get the idea, it's supposed to be a straight line of four. Okay, so this is our updated, this is going to be our residual graph. Now we're going to continue and we're going to work out, you know, our residual capacity of A to S. If you go work that out, again, it's the capacity of A to S minus the flow from A to S plus the flow from S to A. So that is going to give you a zero minus a zero plus a zero. So we don't include that on a graph. But one thing to note is obviously we consider, and this is actually how we set up our network flow structure, we consider that if it doesn't have an edge going in that direction, it has a capacity of zero. So that actually works out here as well. We don't put, add in this edge because it has a capacity of zero. Okay, so we're going to do the next one. So we've done S and A. So we've done, you know, in both directions for that. So let's go and investigate the capacity or the residual capacity of SB. And that is going to be your capacity of SB minus your flow from S to B plus your flow from B to S. So we go work that out. Our capacity is 2, our flow is 2, and we have a zero flow going in the opposite direction. So we end up having a capacity now there of zero. And that makes sense. We've already, the flow has already actually gone through. So it's taken the entire capacity, you know, for that edge. So the residual capacity should be zero because the residual capacity is telling us, hey, what's left over going in that direction? Right. So then we're going to look at the residual capacity of B to S. So we're going to have the capacity of B to S minus the flow from B to S plus the flow from B to S, S to B, sorry, S to B, right, so we're going to have the capacity is zero there, the flow from B to S is zero, but the flow from S to B is two, so we have a capacity of two, what that's saying is, hey, what if we actually did mess up our flows, so we currently have a flow going in there in this direction, if we actually did mess up our pathways with that, we are now going to create a pathway that is going in the opposite direction. So it is saying that we could 
basically back step in our process while looking at you know the new system so it's going to give us an option of erasing what we've done and again this is what the residual flows do so we now have a residual flow from b to s of two okay next up we're running out of space so let me just clean it a bit right so let's continue and let's find the residual capacity of a to c so we're going to have the capacity of a to c minus the flow from a to c plus the flow from c to a and that is going to give us three minus zero plus zero which is going to give us three so we're going to put on our graph three okay now we're going to work out the residual capacity in the opposite direction so we're going to have the capacity of c to a minus the flow of c to a plus the flow of a to c and in this case it's going to be zero minus zero plus zero which is equal to zero so we don't have to put that on the graph next up let's look at the residual capacity of b to d which is your capacity of b to d minus your flow of b to d plus your flow of d to b and that is going to give you your 3 minus your 0 plus your 0, which is going to give you a 3. So we're going to add that to our graph. So if we add that to our graph, we have a 3 sitting over there. So let's also work out the residual capacity in the opposite direction of D to B. And again, it's the capacity of D to B minus the flow of D to B plus the flow of B to D, which is going to be 0 minus 0 plus 0, which is 0. Okay, once again, I'm running out of space, so let me just give me a second to clean the screen, and we're going to continue. We're going to then do for C to B, then D to T, and then C to T. Okay, so let's find our residual capacity of C to B. It's our capacity of C to B minus our flow from C to B plus our flow from B to C. That's going to be our capacity from C to B is 1. We have a zero flow occurring from C to B, but we have two flow occurring here from B to C. So we have plus two, and that is going to give us a capacity of three. So we're sitting with from C to B, we have three. Okay, so let's also work out our residual capacity from B to C. So we're going to have, you know, our capacity from B to C minus our flow from B to C plus our flow from C to B. Okay, so if you go ahead and work that out, we are going to have the capacity is two, okay, minus the flow, the flow is also two, plus the flow from C to B, which is zero. So we end up with a capacity of zero. And that makes sense in that direction because technically, you know, the flow has already cancelled out with the capacity. So we really have a maximum flow occurring there. So we shouldn't really have any residual capacity left over in that direction. Okay, so let's continue and let's work out the residual capacity of D to T. So that's going to be the capacity of D to T minus the flow from D to T plus the flow from T to D. And that's going to give you your capacity is 4 your flow is zero and your flow in the opposite direction is also zero so you still have that full capacity left over and again that should make sense to you like if you have no flow happening there the leftover capacity will be the original capacity so we have that four there okay and then we're just going to work out the residual capacity of c to t and notice i have actually not worked out in the opposite direction i am aware that it should be equal to zero but just in case you are going to do it, but I just want to first work out C to T. So you have your capacity of C to T minus your flow of C to T plus your flow of T to C. That's going to be 2 minus your 2 plus your flow in the opposite direction, you know, is 0, which is going to give you a capacity of 0 there. Then we're going to work out our capacity of T to C is going to give you a capacity of T to C minus your flow of t to c plus your flow of c to t your capacity of t to c is zero 
your flow from T to C is zero, but you have a flow of two happening there, which means you do have a capacity of two in the opposite direction. So you have this thing happening here. And that again makes sense that from your residual capacity from C to T should be zero because your flow is taking up your entire capacity. However, because you have a flow going in that direction, your capacity going in the direction back, in other words, we have the net flow is going to cancel it out, would be two. So that's where that two is coming from. Again, that's actually why I know that my capacity, and in this case of, you know, your D and your T, I know the one coming in the other direction should be zero because there's no flow happening. So there's no capacity and there's no flow. So it should have remained at zero there. But let's just do it as an in-case kind of a check. You have your T and your D. You have your capacity at TD minus your flow at TD plus your flow at DT. And that gives you zero minus zero plus zero, which is equal to zero. Okay, so now we have our residual graph. So our residual graph is the graph, you know, over here in red. And what's going to happen is when we get to the, you know, when we do the forward focusing algorithm is we then utilize this graph to look for a new path because it's incorporating the current flow that we have available to it by utilizing those residual capacities. So when we push another path through with flow, we are then, you know, going to eventually, hopefully, we'll end up, we'll keep on creating residual um, graphs right after we push the flow paths. But in the end, you'll hopefully reach a point where you can no longer make an ST path. And the moment you can no longer make an ST path, you have found your max flow. But right now, this is just an example of basically working out if you have your flow and you have your capacity, so you have a path with flow in it, you can now work out your residual graph, which is a result of that flow, where your, capac your residual capacities are incorporating the idea of that flow into their capacities. So when you end up utilizing this graph in the next you know, iteration, it will incorporate your original capacity. So you're never going to break the original rules of the flow in regards to this problem and this algorithm. Okay, so now we have that residual graph. So it's sitting there on our screens. Now what we're going to have to do now is we have to find a new path that's going from S to T. So we can go ahead and investigate that as well. So we start off obviously at S and we can see, okay, what options do we have available to us? Well, we actually only have the option of going from S to A. So we're like, okay, well, that is definitely going to then be on our path. So we go from S to A. Then we say, okay, we add A. Where can we go from now? Well, we can only go to C. So we have, you know, the C situation and it's going to there. And again, the C, there is only one direction that we can follow. So we continue on. And we're like, we're sitting at B. Then we're looking at B and B can either go to S but S has already been activated and we don't want to create cycles because the whole idea is we're creating a path. So we then go on to the opposite direction. Hopefully that works. If it doesn't work, well, then we no longer have ST paths and then we're kind of done. But in this case, we can continue on. So we have from B to D. Then we have from D to T. Okay, so now we have a path and the path is S to A, A to C, C to B, B to D, and D to T. So now we have our path from S to T. We're going to put in our capacities here just to remind you of you will choose your minimum capacity as the flow that you push through because that minimum capacity is creating a bottleneck. So in this case, our minimum capacity is three. So we have this bottleneck occurring, you know, in all these regions. Just a FYI, that is actually supposed to be four there. So we're going to push through a flow of three. So when we go through this process, we're going to have, you know, three out of four there, three out of three there, three out of three there, three out of three there, and three out of four there. And the rest are going to be your zeros. Okay, so now we have to obviously find the new residual graph of this version of the flowing capacities. Okay, so all I've done is I'm neating it up a bit. So you're going to work out, pause your screen and try and work out the residual capacities for this graph. I'm not going to go through the detailed structure of it because I think by now we're pretty used to finding the residual capacities. 
So I'll suggest pause it, and then the very next slide will actually have the residual capacities and the residual graph associated with this. Okay, so this is our residual graph from that fluorocapacity network. So now the Ford Fulkerson says, okay, you're now going to look for another path that goes from S to T. And the whole idea behind Ford Fulkerson is you keep on doing paths until you reach a point where you can no longer find an SD path. The moment you reach a point where you can no longer find an SD path, that is when you reach, have reached your maximum flow. So let's first just investigate if we can find an SD path on this graph. So we start at S, and the only option we have is to go to A. Then we are sitting at A here, and the only option you know, for A is to go to S, but S has already been activated, so we can't actually do that. It creates a cycle. So we no longer have you know, a ST path available. So that means that all the flows that we've worked out now, so up until this point, they are going to be our maximum flow. So let's actually put all those things together so you can actually see how it works and where it's coming from. Okay, so just a reminder of the process is we started off with a graph. We found a path on the graph so that we could push the flow through it. And obviously we choose whichever one of our capacities will bottleneck it to be the flow that is occurring on that path. So we had, you know, a path S, B, C, T with a flow of two. So now we have the path. We then create the residual from the flow path. Then we take the residual and we find a new another path on it. So this is the next step. So we perform the depth first search. We create a new path. We utilize the bottleneck of the capacities as the actual flow through the path. And then we look again at the residual graph that is created from this path. Okay, so that is, again, I've just put, you know, the first one there. We had that residual. We got the path. We found the flow, and then we look at the residual of that one. And once we have the residual of that one, we again look for an ST path. There is no more ST paths, which means we are done. We're at the maximum flow. So now how do we actually show the maximum flow? Okay, so to explain the whole concept of now that we have all our different flow paths, how does it relate to our original graph? I put the two flow paths on the one side and the original graph on the other side. So now we can investigate and we can say, okay, in path one, we had a flow going from S to B of two. So we know, you know, for definites that that is something that happens. We also have from C to T, we're going to have the two and two, and I've gone in the capacity there. So let's just write it in. So we have the two and two situation there. Where things are going to get a bit different is, you know, in this area, but I'll elaborate on that in a bit. Okay, so let's then look at Path two. Path two had a flow of three over there. So we have three out of four over there, and we have three out of three over there. And again, that CB is going to be slightly different to look at, so I don't want to look at it yet. We know we're going to have three out of three there, and we know we're going to have three out of four there. Now we have to consider, you know, where both paths, we have a back and forth situation. So what is the total flow happening on those paths? So we have three going in that direction, and we have two going in that direction. So we have a total flow of one going in that direction. Why? Again, because we had the three going like this, and we had the two going like this. So the total flow is one going down. So that's just looking at like three plus minus two situation. So we have a situation over here where we have this one out of one capacity is being filled. Okay, so when we do the, the, the actual maximum flow and we discuss the, the flow and capacity on our original graph, we do have to take that into account. And we can take that into account by looking at the total flow. And then the total flow will, will fill that one in in our original graph. Okay, so now we know that our net flow into T is the 3 plus the 2 because they're both going inwards. So we have a max flow of five and we can also if we go and investigate you know our flows through everything that everything is going to balance so flows into a vertex is going to equal the flows out of the vertex so let's actually investigate that quickly particularly you know in the, the slightly murky areas 
So we have two going in and we have one going in. We have nothing happening here. So we don't actually put anything over there. So it's zero out of two kind of situation. And because of that, we have three going in and we have three leaving here. And you're like, but wait, but we said that we had to have two flow going from B to C. But one of the things to consider is that we had three flow in here from A to C. So the three flow in there from A to C gets split. So it gets split to fulfill the two over here and the one in that direction. Okay, so let's just remind you of that. So you have your three, your three is going to be split. So you're going to have two going into there and you're going to have one going into there. And then your BD is actually going to get, you know, its flow from that two that's sitting over here and that one that's coming in. And that's going to give you your three. So it does work out. And that's what the residual capacities are doing. It's taking into account you have your back flow and your forward flow. Well, in the end, you're only going to need a total flow going in one direction. So it's taking that into account and it's working with that when determining your paths. And then when you put it back onto your graph, you consider the total flow that's coming out of all those different paths instead of just throwing down, you know, the flow of each path. So even when I was filling in the twos and the threes in the other areas, I was actually considering the total flow. I was going and going, okay, we have S to B. It goes in that direction, there's a flow of two. And then we look at S to B. In that direction, there's a flow of zero. So the total flow is the flow that I put here. So just be aware and be reminded of that, you know, aspect.